Check, check. So we're going to read today from Jonah 4. Um, and as I end the reading today, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord. And if you agree with that, you can respond by saying thanks be to God. Let's read together. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. This is the word of the Lord. Design. Good morning. Good morning. I appreciate you being here. If you're a guest with us today, thank you. Uh, you're always welcome here. Uh, and I hope that today is your final day of being a guest with us uh, and that you will be, make this your regular place of attendance. You're getting to see us at all our best today. A uh, couple of quick things that I want to remind you about uh, as we talk about. Um, uh, closing out this message today. You know, a lot of things have happened this week, haven't they? Uh, who would have thought that there would be an earthquake in another area of the world? And as of today, I think close to 30,000 people are dead. Wow. I mean, uh, they're in uh, just, I guess it would be to the west of there even, there is a, um, a war that's still raging. You know, we read in the scripture about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. And, you know, we went through a series not long ago about the book of Revelation. And I do believe, I want you to hear me, our days are growing short. And, um, you know, we pray for revival I mean, have any of you ever prayed for revival like, and said, Lord, would you do a fresh work? Well, I want to make sure that you know. I don't know if you know this or not. Just a short distance to the north from here, a little school called Asbury College up in uh, Kentucky. Um, it's a Methodist school. During their chapel this Wednesday, this past Wednesday, um, when it was all over, they had sung, they had prayed, they had, somebody had taught a lesson, and nobody left. The end of the night, nobody had left. I think the last I checked this morning, nobody has still left. They've been praying together since Wednesday, praying and worshiping and asking the Lord, confessing sin, asking the Lord to do an incredible, incredible thing. And you know, in the day in which we live, where there are earthquakes, there are famines, there's war, 
there is all kinds of things that are happening, even in our own country, right? It, yeah, how many of us have always looked around and, or looked around in the, in the last year or so and said, this place is crazy. We need the Lord to do something. Well, folks, I want you to know he is. He is doing something. And you know what my prayer is? My prayer is, is that he would do something here. I'm praying what's happening up in Kentucky would begin to sweep this direction. You know, there are schools, other colleges that have begun to meet and pray together. And, and man, we're just asking the Lord to do a great thing. So today, if you're a guest and you showed up here and you're going, you know, I think I'm going to try that place out. Well, I want you to hear, you've come to a place where I'm begging the Lord to do a work in our body that he would do something that is only by his power and by his spirit. But also know that what he, when he desires to do that, he begins with his people. And so I'm asking that today, that he would do something in our lives, in us. I'm asking that he would do something in me. Uh, my prayer today, when I was on my knees before the start of this, was that, Lord, when you bring people in, would you convict us of our sin and would you show us so that we might repent and turn, that we would be relentlessly repenting. And so uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask for us to start today. Would you pray with me and ask the Lord to do something in our body, do something in our midst, to do something in you today that he would speak to you? Would you, would you do that with me? Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, we love you. And Father, I know that today you have a word for us. I know that you have a word for me, Father. I know that you desire to do something in our midst that is beyond anything that we could ever imagine. And Lord, I pray that it would begin today and that it would not end, it would not cease, and that it would overflow this room, and that it would move out into the streets and into our neighborhoods and across the world. Father, I thank you for what you're doing at Asbury College. I thank you, Father that you are calling people to life and repentance. I ask that you would do this here. Father, I pray for the people who have been so greatly affected in Turkey and Syria. And Lord, I know that that has not caught you off guard. And I ask, Father, for our, um, our brothers and sisters, believers who are in that region, who are rushing in, Father, to, to give aid and ministry. Lord, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit would draw people and point them to Jesus as Savior. Lord, I'm praying that you would begin to do a work and that, God, you, through the devastation that's happening in Ukraine, Lord, that there would be a revival that would take place. Lord, I know that to some ears it may sound crazy, like, what, what are we praying? What I mean, or the devastation, but I know that you use all of these things to get our attention, to point us to Jesus, who is our only hope, who is our only salvation, who brings life, who brings peace. Peace. There's something about the name of Jesus. And so today, Jesus, we ask that you would be strong, that you would be mighty, that you would call us to surrender that you would call us to be people of prayer, that you would call us to be people of your word and people of compassion, people who've been changed and want to, to go to the neighborhoods, to the highways, to the byways, across the ocean for the name who at which one day all of us will bow before, the name of Jesus. And so today, have your way in this room and it's in the name of Jesus that we ask these things. Amen. We're closing out a series today uh, in the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4. We're about to move into another series in the Old Testament in the book of Ruth. So if you're one of those who likes to get ahead, uh, start reading the book of Ruth. But we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4 today. And uh, we're going to be uh, uh, kind of wrapping things up and asking the Lord, hey, what do you have to say to me today? So if you've got a Bible, open it up, turn it on. Uh, I want you to pull out a piece of paper and a pen. We're going to be uh, taking a few notes today and looking through what is it that the Lord has to say to each of us. In the early 1700s, 
there was a, uh, a young man born in Germany. His name was Nicholas von Zinzendorfer. Kind of a long name, right? He otherwise known as Count von Zinzendorfer. He was born to a very well-off, noblesse family uh, of good uh, amounts of money. In fact, he ended up being raised by his grandmother who... Uh, had a great desire for her grandson to move into government, and that way he could continue on with the noble aristocratic life. He had a lar uh, large amount of money that was due to come to him, and, but rather than do that, uh, he had another passion that had overtaken him. You see, he lived just after uh, the, the very seeds of the Reformation were even beginning to take place, uh, and had taken place. He lived in an area where um, John Huss lived, who wanted to bring the Bible to the people. And so he decided what he would do is he would take all of his money and he would move to the far eastern corner of Germany and he would set up a stronghold, a small community of play, a place, an estate, if you will, where fleeing refugees, Christians who were refugees from what was the Roman Catholic Church of the day, uh, they would be able to come, they would be able to learn, they'd be able to study, they'd be able to grow. Shortly after getting there, shortly after building this, shortly after uh, people began to flow into there, and in a very short amount of time, there were uh, a community of over 300 people who were there. Uh, within a very short few years, they began a prayer gathering. One of the things that is they're famous for that, uh, as you look back in history, is that prayer gathering was 24-7, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, someone was praying. That went on for over 100 years, 100 years. Somewhere around 30 years after the start of that, they had already sent out over 300 different missionaries around the world to unreached areas, places like the West Indies, to Africa, to South Asia, to Southeast Asia. In fact, I want to stop right here and say Zion will be leaving in tomorrow morning. Uh, he's leaving with a, a group. They're headed to uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and they're going to be working with a group of people. He'll be out for the next eight or nine days. And uh, I, I want us to make sure that we remember Zion, we, you know, as, as he goes. He's leaving behind a, a wife and a brand new little baby. And so we we'll want to remember him as he goes. But uh, they had already begun to send out missionaries everywhere around the world for the glory of God. Why do I tell you and start out this sermon today? Uh, really, as I've started out just about every sermon over the last three weeks, this is our fourth week of this, uh, with a mission story, is because I, I really believe that if we're going to catch what this book, Jonah, is really all about, we've got to understand that we have a relentless God in pursuit of a relentless people who will continually call us to relentless repentance so that he will send us relentlessly for his people. Do you know that God loves people? God has a desire for people. God loves people more than we can ever imagine. And his whole desire for you and for me is that we would go. And I believe that he has a desire for us. I believe that in this room today, you've heard me say this now, this would be the third time out of four weeks that I've been praying that God would call some of you to go. As much as I want people to keep coming, I'm praying that God would send some of you out of here, that you would go across the world, that you would go maybe move to another state, that you might move to another city where people do not know Jesus. And you would say, I'm going to go give my life for the gospel there. Just like there was a small community of people up in northeastern Germany who began to pray and God began to do, really one of the very first mission sending movements came out of those people. The Moravians is what they were called. You know what? There's another small band of people who meet at 307 Warrior Drive that I'm asking God to do the exact same thing with. That he would do that with us. That he would 
change us, that he would awaken us, that he would call us to himself, and that he would ignite something in us, and that he would send us out with a passion for his name. That whether it's across the ocean or across the street, that's what I'm praying. That's what I think we're going to see today. So with that, and there's a couple of things that we're going to catch today. The first one is this. We're going to talk about Jonah's distraction, and we're going to talk about God's compassion. Let's talk about Jonah's distraction first and foremost. I'm going to read back through verses 1 through 4 of Jonah chapter 4. Read with me if you don't mind. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful. You're slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? I don't know about you, but this is not what I expected that you would read at the beginning of chapter 4 after what he's just experienced and seen in chapter 3. I mean, here's Jonah, the prophet of God, who's received the word of God, who ran from the word of God, who got tossed into an ocean, and in the the grace of the Lord, he sent a, a large fish, swallowed him up, took him back to the beach, spit him out, and sent him on his way. Jonah actually went and obeyed finally what it was that the Lord had called him to do, told him, this is what your job is, and it says that in an eight-word sermon, in an eight-word sermon, all right, Listen, uh, the entire kingdom turned. The in- this is a preacher's dream. I want you to hear me. <laughs> this is a preacher's dream, that you would preach a message that you feel like the Lord has given, and the neighborhood would change, the city would change, the state would change, the, the government structures would go, man, the Lord is doing something. This is what happens. This is what, this is what we would desire to see. You know what Jonah gets here? Jonah in chapter three, he got a picture of Acts chapter two before Acts chapter two ever came along. You remember what happened in Acts chapter two? It was Pentecost. When Peter gets up and he preaches and 3,000 people come to know Jesus, they surrender their life. He, he gets to see that on steroids. A hun- I mean, the whole place comes. I mean, the Ninevites are walking with God. And what is Jonah doing? He's angry. Look look what the scripture says. Look at verse 1. It says, but, but it displeased Jonah. Uh, notice, Notice the adjective. Exceedingly, exceedingly. And he was angry. Uh, listen, he, he was ticked off. I mean, he, you could put another couple of words in there depending on what your vocation might be and what you would hear at work. This is what he was. He was angry that people had turned to God. In fact, verse 2 kind of gives you the impression. It kind of leaves the door open a little bit in chapter 4, verse 2, that when he was in his home country that he had had a conversation with the Lord about this. God, isn't this what I said when you told me to go the first time? Isn't this what I said? No, you're going to do this. This is who you are. This is why I got on a boat and I went the other way. And then he goes on, he, he just goes on to call out the attributes of who God is. Notice what he says there. He says, you're gracious, you're merciful, God, you're slow to anger. You abound in steadfast love. And you turn away from your wrath. God, I knew this is exactly what you were going to do. You're, you're sending me to these people, and you were going to do this. This is why I went the other way. Are you catching right here? Are you catching the heart of Jonah? This, I mean, this was a prophet of the Lord. He had heard the Lord speak. You remember back in, in uh, 2 Kings, uh, Jonah was one who received the word. Jonah was one who had gone and spoken on, the, on behalf of the Lord. And yet he had gone to the king to do that. And when he had gone to the king, 
he had spoken out against, don't do it, the Assyrians. So it's one thing to speak against someone. Now you want me to go and speak to them. Notice though, what you get. Jonah here, what he knows is he knows God's character right here. Jonah has all the Bible answers. Jonah's the one who can sit in Sunday school, a small group, and he knows all the answers. Jonah's the one that when someone calls you, they think they should call you because call so-and-so, they'll know. But what Jonah knew had not traveled to here. He, he didn't live in that. Jonah was obedient. Jonah did exactly, but it, it, it had not made a difference in his heart. Listen, I need you to hear me today. God is not as concerned about your service. This is, this is scripture. <laughs> he is not concerned about your, your, your service as much as he's concerned about your heart. He wants your heart. It's not your sacrifice that I'm concerned about. It's your heart that I desire. Oh, yes, we need to be serving the Lord because there are implications of following after the Lord, right? Because I follow him, uh, because I trust him, I do these things. Because, not because I want him to love me more, but because I do, he does love me, I want to live after him. There is something right and good about good theology and good practice. I mean, that's what we want to do. You want good theology. You want good practice. You want good thoughts so that you have gr great living. This is the whole point. But something is off in Jonah. I, 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 something's off here. Look at verse 3. I'd rather die than live to see Nineveh redeemed. I, I, I want that to settle for just a moment. Jonah, who's just seen the hand of the Lord move, he said, but I'd rather die. I'd rather die than see Nineveh redeemed. Aren't you glad, though, that verse 4 comes along? Look what, look what God says to him. God doesn't condemn him. God just asks him a question. God just asks him a question. Look at what it says in verse 4. Verse 4 says, do you do well to be angry? You know, when I was uh, raising kids and they were in my home, I would always, when it, when it got time to have a really good conversation and I re really needed to know something, I, I would always usually look at them and go, hey, remember, I really want you to tell me the truth because mom and dad really already know the truth. You, you realize that what was happening right here, what was happening here is that God, God, God knew it wasn't like God was trying to find something out. What he was wanting is for Jonah to find something out. He was wanting Jonah to understand. This goes all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? When, when uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and they went and made fig leaves, and they went and hid. The, the scripture tells us in, Jonas, in Genesis chapter 3, God comes walking, and he says, Adam, where are you? Did, you think God didn't know where Adam was? Well, I was, you know, I, 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 I was embarrassed. We were, we were naked. Who, who told you you were naked? Did, did you eat from the tree? She did. She did. <laughs> she gave it to me. You see, folks, listen, when I, I want to I clue us in here on something. When the Scripture asks us a question, it's, it's not so that the Lord knows, it's so that we understand. He's speaking to us. He's trying to draw our attention here. And that's why confession, confess, see, when we repent, when we turn back, when we, remember what Martin Luther said, all of life, all of the Christian life, is about repentance. And you know what repentance is? It's, conf it's coming back. It's confessing. It's, Father, I know that what I've done is sin against you. And I'm agreeing with you. I'm coming home. I'm back. I want our fellowship to be correct. It's meeting with your wife, your spouse, your husband, your child, and you confess something so that relationship is restored. You see, this is what was happening here. What God was really saying to him is, Jonah, really? Seriously? 
you, you're my prophet. You're my child. Well, you're, you're angry? Really? You have everything. I've given you all of my riches are yours, Jonah. You've walked with me. I've given you my word. I've provided for you. I've let you speak on my behalf. Follower of Christ, do you realize that's yours? You're a child of God. You're, you're his. He's giving you everything you could ever need. He loves you. I can't tell you how many times I end up having conversations with people and we begin to talk and they're, they're weighted down as followers of Christ because they didn't do this, this, and this. And then I've repented, I've turned, and I want them to always hear and understand this. And I want to say to you today, the Lord God loves you. You're his. If, if you've submitted your life to him, you're his child. He loves you. There's nothing you can do to cause him to love you more. There's nothing you can do to cause him to love you less. His love has been set on you because of Jesus Christ. But I think oftentimes what ends up happening is, is we end up playing Jonah in our own story. Or at least I find myself doing that. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that situation? You see, Jonah hated the Ninevites is what you see. Why did he hate them so bad? They were there, well, a couple of things. Number one, they were the most feared and the most brutal of all the enemies. You remember that back from the beginning of this book? Go back and listen, watch Jonah chapter one. They were the most feared, the most hated. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah loved his national Jewish identity. I'm a Jew. I'm God's chosen people. I'm not going to go cast pearls before swine. Uh, you want me to do what? He loved his position as a priest, as a prophet in the land. He had authority. He had a claim because you remember he had gone and spoken against the, the, the Assyrians to the king. Do this and we'll be safe. You see, I really, really believe that Jonah... Jonah didn't understand how much God loved people. Jonah knew that he loved him, but these folks, there's no way. You see, God chose the Jewish people, not because they were strong, not because they were mighty, not because they were great in number. He chose them and he set them apart so that they might be a light to all the other nations. Follower of Christ, do you realize that's why God chose you? Do you realize that you have nothing? I have nothing to bring to this. All of my righteousness, all of my goods, all, any abilities that I have are only because of his grace upon me so that others might. This is the same for you and for me. What Jonah had begun to do is he had begun to wrap his identity up in all kinds of things other than the fact that he was chosen by God. And when we place our identity, when we let our identity get wrapped up in our job, most men struggle with that. We get wrapped up in our families, our kids, our identity. Most moms deal with that. Not that dads don't, moms don't trade it out, but I'm just talking generally speaking. When we let our identity get wrapped up in our sexuality, when we let our identity get wrapped up in our sport, our position, our finances, our, when our identity of who we are and our place in the kingdom is anything other than child of God, saved by grace alone, I need you to know Everything else around us gets out of whack. Everything else gets out of whack. Maybe this morning, maybe this morning you're in here and maybe you're like Jonah and you're angry. And maybe this morning the Lord is saying to you, do you do well to be angry? I don't know. Maybe it's, 
You're angry about work. You're angry about a, a medical issue. You're angry at a spouse. You're angry at a, a business deal that went south and it's cost you all of these things. You're angry about a financial situation. Maybe the Lord today is looking at you and going, do you do well to be angry? Some of us in here, maybe it's, maybe it's not angry. Maybe it's apathy. Maybe it's just apathy. Man, you're kind of half in, you're kind of half out. Kind of cruise in, kind of cruise out. Not about being generous, about being a tipper. Not, not about getting too close, just kind of hanging to the edge. May, I see this a lot with husbands and wives sometimes. I see where maybe one of the spouses is really in, and the other one just kind of, I'm here, I'm just kind of going, kind of hang out on the edge. Folks, listen, the, you are a child of God. And the Lord may stand in here today, and the Holy Spirit might be saying to you, do you do well to be apathetic today? Jonah, Jonah, what are you doing? Wake up, Jonah. You know what I think was happening here? You know, I said a minute ago, we're going to talk about Jonah's distraction. I think Jonah was so distracted by his idols. And what was his idols? All of this identity stuff. You see, it's easy to talk about who Christ is and what he's done in our huddle. Jonah going to the king of Israel. You want me like to leave my kingdom and you want me to go over there now? No, I'm going the other way. In fact, I don't even like those people. I don't even like those people. Jonah, that's where I want you to go. Why do you want me to go there? Because I love those people. I love them. And today, what I think could be happening is that in our own lives, we have idols in our own lives that have become distractions for us. And as I said a few weeks ago, and I have to keep kind of coming back to them, is that we don't even recognize many times they're idols. <laughs> they're good things. Jobs and finances and kids and this event and that event and this event, but when they begin to set up shop and they begin to, well, well, let me ask you this. Is there something that the Lord might be touching in your heart? He's been whispering in your ear about it, and you think, I don't know if I could let that go. I don't know if I could lay that down. I don't know that I could. Your heart beats a little fast. You, you get a little palm sweaty, if you will. Listen, if you can't live without it, you can't stop thinking about it, and you can't lay it down, there's a good chance that's an idol in your life. And it will become a distraction. It'll become a distraction to all the things that God wants to use you for, for his kingdom and for his glory, for his good. See, I think this was what was happening in Jonah. But the story goes on. Look at number, the last thing real quick. is I want us to look at God's compassion. Jonah was distracted. His distraction led to a lack of devotion. But God wasn't going to leave him there. God simply is more interested in people coming to know him. And he's not going to leave his children. Remember, he's not going to, leave, he's not going to let you be the one to keep someone else from coming to know Christ. He's inviting you to join in on this. And this is exactly what we've seen here today. He's after the hearts of his servants as much as he's after the hearts of, his, of, other, of lost people. And he wants you and invites you to join him today. The story continues in verse 5. Look down there at verse 5. Jonah goes out of the city, it says. All this has happened. He goes out of the city. He's upset. He, in fact, he goes over to uh, a, an area where, that sits up a little bit away from the city. He builds, it says, a booth. Some of yours may say a booth. It's a tent, a shade area, so that he can sit back and he's going to watch. Maybe God's going to Maybe, maybe this isn't going to last, and God's going to rain down, like he said, in those 40 days. And I'm going to sit here, and I want to begin to see it. 
He's so frustrated, and his heart is on display now. I mean, it's out there. But what God does is he relentlessly pursues his people. He doesn't let Jonah just stay there. He's never, ever done exposing our idols. This is why it always pays to go ahead and repent, lay it down, confess it to him. Because as a true child of God, he's not going to let that thing continue to hold a spot reserved only for him. So what does he do? Look at verse 6. Verse 6, Jonah, uh, God finds Jonah, he's sulking, he appoints a plant. I think that's a key word. He appoints a plant to grow, and it provides shade for him. And did you realize what it says? He was exceedingly glad because of the plant. He was exceedingly angry a few minutes ago, and now he is exceedingly glad because of a plant that has come up. It's provided more shade for him. It's providing for him. Verse 7 and 8, though, what happened? God appoints a worm. That worm comes, and as quickly as it came up, that plant has been eaten. Not only that, when Jonah wakes up the next morning, he's sunburnt, he's ticked off, he's dried out because God also appointed a wind to come, a scorching wind, it says. And the sun was beating down on him. Folks, do you realize, do you, I, want, I want, to, want to draw you back to chapter one. Chapter one, God appointed, God appointed a wind. He appointed a boat to be destroyed. He appointed a fish trying to get... What is God doing at the end of this? He's appointed. He's appointed a plant. He's appointed a worm. He's appointed a wind. Folks, I need you to hear me. The Lord is chasing after you today. And some of you are running, and he, if you would stop running, he would quit chasing. You stop you turn to him, you repent, you confess. You know what? He's right there to extend his gracious love, his mercy. He is relenting from disaster. He's relenting. Notice that God asks him this. He says, uh, or Jonah turns to God and he says, it's better for me to die than to live. You took my plant, now take my life. Have you ever been in a situation like that where things look so drastic? Maybe, maybe you not are really wanting to die. Some of you may have really been where you have wanted to die. And I need you to hear me. If you're in that spot today, we want to walk with you. We want to come alongside you. Even as followers of Jesus Christ, uh, we can face depressing times. We can face things that become so overwhelming. We want to walk with you. We want to walk with you. But some of you, maybe, you've been in a situation where you've just gone, oh gosh, I, I don't know. I'm done. I'm just, I am done. I mean, Jonah cries out here. Lord, you took my plant. Now take my life. What else is there? I mean, it's like it just comes in waves, God. He's angry about God doing something great. You saved our enemies. You took my plant. You took my life. Notice in verse 9, God asking this again. He comes back, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And, and this is very emphatic the way it's written. It says, yes, I do well. Yes, I'm angry. I'm upset. Look at verse 10. Look what God says, 10 and 11. And the Lord said, I, I, I really want you to focus on this. I want you to hear what the Lord is saying. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city for which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. God says, Jonah, you're consumed with care about the wrong things. You're caring about plants. I care about people. Folks, what is it today that you're caring about so much that's keeping you from the people God has called you to? What is that? 
Because what we know is this, is that as followers of Christ, He has called us to go. Matthew 28, 19, 20. He's called us to go with His commission. But what is it that we're caring about? You see, God's making it incredibly clear in this closing out passage here is that His heart, His heart is all about people. It's about people. It's about people who are near. It's about people who are far. His heart always, I think we could even use the word relentlessly, beats for those who do not know him. It's always on there. His soul longs to save. That, that's what his desire is. And so what does God do? He challenges God's heart, Jonah's heart. He challenges his motivation. He challenges his priorities. And he's doing the same thing for you and me today in this room. Look at the, look at the next verse. Look, look at that next verse, verse 12. Yeah, there is in verse 12. You know, I think in God's sovereign plan, we're, he didn't choose to let us know what happened with Jonah after that. You know, we, we really don't know, did Jonah get it or not? We don't really know if he did or not. Now, most scholars believe that this book was written years later, and it is a him writing, an autobiography, him writing from a dis disappointed point of view for himself. So yeah, I, th I think he did come around. Obviously, it's in the Scripture. But really, I don't think the point is whether or not Jonah gets it or not. I think the point is whether or not you and I get it. Do you remember the very first question I asked in, in the very first message? When I said, you know, one of the questions we have to ask is, who is Jonah? And you remember what the answer was? It's you and me. <laughs> We're Jonah. We're Jonah. And I think verse 9 is addressed to you and me. Do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to harbor bitterness? Do you do well to keep a grasp on? Do you do well to protect? Do you do well to run away? Do you? What is it that the Lord is asking you today that you do well to that keeps you from the very people that he's called you to. What? Who is it? You see, ultimately what he wants to know is, is what are you living for? What is it that you're living for? Is it to make money? Is it to have a great retirement, to have a great home when you end up at retirement, a second, third home? Is it to have this great vacation? Is it so that my kids can... For most of us, you know what it is? It's our comfort. It's our comfort. For most of us in here, you would probably say right now, life is good. Well, wow, it's, I, I don't, it's not that you don't, we don't have problems, but we're comfortable. And the Lord is calling you today, and I want to ask you, will you waste all that he's given Will you waste it all? Rather than laying open-handed, bare before him, God, send me. God, let me know what you desire of me. Some of you today, you're so worried that God's going to call you to sell everything and head to another country on the other side of the world. Usually, it doesn't work that way. Usually, he begins to call you across the street or across town first. And for most of us in here, do you know going across the street would be huge? Yeah, several years ago, we started talking about what it means to go to the nations. And we said, you know, the Lord's brought the nations to our neighbors. And I want to ask you something. 
I, I want you to begin to think about what is our response? Well, the first response is this. I, I, I'm going to ask you, pull up these cards. Everyone's got them. They're right near you. I'm going to ask you, would you be willing to commit to go? Would you be willing to commit to go? And I'm going to ask you to think about this. Would you be willing to think about going to a neighbor? I, I want you to think about real quickly, what would it look like if you're, I want you to imagine your neighborhood, your street, your neighborhood. Could you imagine if all of the people in your neighborhood came to know Jesus Christ and like that street, like it was a fellowship of Christ. Some of you are going, man, I don't know if I could preach that well. Well, no, I, I just need you to develop a friendship with somebody next door. <laughs> How about just start there? You develop a friendship. Would you be willing to go to your neighbors? Would you be willing to go? Some of you, listen, we're re, our, all of our trips are back, all of our sending trips. We want you to jump into a trip. I told you last week, I, Amy and I are going to be leading a trip to uh, Brazil in, uh, in July. Uh, I'd love for you to go with us. You can sign up out in the hallway. There are about 10 other opportunities. Listen, uh, the other one, there's all kinds of local opportunities. You know, we have local partners who are here with us today. They're going to be in the hallway. Uh, on the back, what are you interested in being in? You know, the Lord's given you a heart and a passion for people. Ministries that he's called you to. I'm, in, I'm asking you, would you go? Would you, would you lay down the distraction and you just begin to find out, how can I be involved? I'm asking you not only to go, I'm asking you to give. Uh, a guy who has meant a lot to me in my ministry that I study a lot, his name is John Piper. He says there are three types of people when it comes to missions. There are those who go, there are those who send, and there are those who disobey. And in this room right now, I recognize that not all of you will go, but all of us can give so that others can go. Do you know that we have missionaries right now who, who are out uh, on, our go, on the Go Center wall who they need, they still need finances. Do you know there are opportunities in all of these ministries out here that you're going to walk in where, there are play, where you have the ability to get involved with them? Did you realize for us to be able to send missionaries, for us to be able to go, it takes finances for us just here. Giving is never about checking a box. Giving is about our heart. It's about our heart. You know, if the Lord would just let me win that lotto, I'd take care of everything. Here's what I know, is that if he gives you a $10 bill and you can't steward a dollar of it, you won't steward $10 million. The question is, is will you be generous with what it is that God has given you? Just to be honest with you, you can't go without the dough, huh? It takes finances for the ministry to happen. Would you be faithful in that? And the last thing is this, would you commit to pray? Oswald Chambers, in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, he says this, prayer doesn't fit us for the greatest work. Prayer is the greatest work. And all of these things are dependent on our prayer. In 1732, there were two Moravians. One was named Johann Dauber and the other one was David Nitschmann. They had decided that they were going to go. They were a part of that ministry that Count von Zinzendorfer had begun. They decided they were going to go to the West Indies, what we would not know today as St. Thomas and St. Croix, to take the gospel. No one would allow them to go. No one would send them. Nobody, there was no way for them to get there. And then they realized, hey, what if we sold ourselves into slavery to a slave ship? Headed to the West Indies. They went down to a dock. Found a slave trader. Their whole community came with them prayed over them. They sold themselves to the slave trader. And as they were on the ship, sailing out, and they said, may glory to the lamb who suffered be his reward. 
And we do well to what? Father, we love you and we honor you. And I'm asking that today, God, would you call people in this room? God, would you call us to a life of sacrifice? Would you call us to a life of ministry? God, if there are those in here who need to surrender their life to you as Lord and Savior, today, Father, would you make this that day? Would you awaken them? Father, today, if there are those who need prayer, would you give them courage to come and let us pray for them? Oh, Lord Jesus, we need you. This city needs you. Our community needs you. And you've set a small community at 307 Warrior Drive to be your instrument as a part of that. Now, Father, would you move us out? And it's in the name of Jesus that I ask these things today. I'm going to ask that you stand around the room. We're going to close with a song. And as we sing this song, we'll sing together. I'm going to be down here. I'd love to pray with you. Maybe you want someone to meet with you. I would be here. Amy is down here. Uh, We would love to pray with you. We'll have teams out in the foyer who where you can go after this and meet them and talk to them. And, hey, how do I do this? How do I get involved here? How do I do this? Uh, I want to sign up for a trip. You can go do that. There's opportunities for that out there. You be obedient to what it is that the Lord has called you to today. Zion, come lead us.